folks, a warm welcome to today's episode of Moose on the Loose podcast in association with White Moose Media. Today, a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, might I add, the most eminent, Dr. Richie Malloy, is joining us. You're not really a doctor. I'm not really you? a doctor. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, thank you. I don't know why why I kind of always call you a doctor on social media, but uh, we just clarify that now. Richie isn't a doctor. Yeah. How are you, Richie? Paul, I'm really good. Uh, really excited to be sitting here, actually. Yeah. Uh, I'll just explain a bit of background. Okay. Yeah. So, so Richie, you reside in Ackle now. I do. And I, um, I suppose it was about two years ago, was listening to News Talk one day. Can't quite remember who the fet was it. Was it Shane Coleman or one of them that, or was it Lunchtime Live or something? It was Lunchtime Live, yeah. Yeah, I was listening to Lunchtime Live and uh, there was a fella on it who had moved to Ackill, who was in recovery. He moved to Ackill to get away from it all and he used one word that really resonated with me and it was actually what inspired me to move to Ackill. Can you remember that word? Safe. Yeah. He moved to Ackill. For safety, to be safe. That resonated with me so much that I actually, I was a bit of a copycat who did exactly the same. <laughs> so now the two of us are on Eichel Island. Well, ironically enough, Paul, what actually the first time that we met, mm. we had, there was two mutual friends of ours mm. who came to the house that I'm now living in in Eichel. Mm. And you were good friends with Leah. That's right, yeah. And Leah had contacted you. She told me about you and uh, she contacted me. And she wanted to do yoga in the front garden in my house. Yeah. And uh, I said, yeah, no problem. She said, a friend of mine, Paul's going to come around. That's the first day I met you. Yeah. That was actually before the interview, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. That was was nearly a year before the interview. But I wasn't living full time in Ackle at that point. No, you were up and down. But I'd met you then and we exchanged numbers and, Mm. you know, I spoke a little bit about my recovery. But, and you are quite a reserved person in real life, not what you see on Instagram. Mm. And we discussed it a bit, but you were kind of not closed off from it. But it was all, I was just a new person. So I think you, you kind of feel people out first. Before you open up, I test the waters. Yes, I'm a sh- I'm actually like, and a lot of people that I meet in real life, as opposed to fake life on Instagram, would kind of say to me, uh, "You know what? You're kind of quiet. Mm. You're, you're a different person completely." Yeah, I and thought I, I thought you were very shy. Mm. And um, I am. Like there was an awkwardness, mm. and uh, but I got your number and you had my number. I remember texting you. I texted you a couple of times because uh, I knew you were kind of back and forth. And I was on my own as well, really. You know, I only I only knew a handful of people mm. that we'll talk about throughout the story of of kind of how me, for one, and you reinvented our, ourselves in Ackle mm. and what Ackle lent to us to, and allowed us to do that. Mm. Then fast forward, which was probably a year, year and a half later, because I remember I sent you a message on on WhatsApp and there was no blue ticks. It's like the fucker. When he answered my text. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and then I got a call from you one day. Mm. And, and the, the opening of the phone call was Richie. I apologise. I, I didn't actually realise that I had a message in, in from you. Yeah. And it's a year ago. And you said, I think, the, you know, the start of that conversation was thank you. I said, what, what do you mean? It's like I heard your interview and wow, like that's exactly what you said was you needed to hear at that time. Mm. The because, journey started. Yeah, because like... I mean, I'd love to say that my recovery has been, I've been living a clean life for the past. I'd love to say for 15 years I'm sober now, but the reality of my recovery is that it's been up and down and Mm. it's like I've slipped. Mm. I've slipped more often than maybe even you know, Mm. you know, um, whatever about the followers back at home. At that point in time, it was a low point. Mm. Drink was obviously my drug of choice, but I don't think any addict really limits his substance. To, I don't think you can only be addicted. If you're an addict, I don't think you can, there's only one thing. You can, mm. you can be addicted to a suite of, I presume. Yeah, yeah. Some people are like that. And like, personally, I call it a drug of no choice. Mine was cocaine because when I start taking it, I have no choice as to when I'm going to stop. Mm. I don't, I cannot stop on my own power. I have no decision over that. Mm. It's a multitude of things, but like you're talking about having slips, I unfortunately never had slips. Every time that I went back out using, and then most of the time it was against my own will, I just didn't want it anymore. 
Um, but I had no solution, I had no program. It wasn't a slip, it was full-blown addiction again. Like it brought me to my knees every single time. Mm. Every single, and, and worse, it progressively got worse and worse and worse. And when was the last time you used? I suppose my surrender date is what I call it. Mm. It was the day that I moved to Ackle, which was the 5th of November 2020. So just over, just over three years, uh, clean and sober. But the journey. Oh, well done on that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I do appreciate that. And you've witnessed mm. nearly all of my recovery this time. Mm. But I suppose the, the kind of the history behind it, you know, what started off as fun. And it was a lot of fun for the longest time. And not fully understanding the power that this had over me. Like I remember recreationally trying different drugs when I was younger. And it doesn't matter how or why. You know, people can say peer pressure or environments and all that sort of stuff. It doesn't really matter. And that's where my acceptance is today. Like if, when I stop trying to figure out why the, why the hell am I an addict? Why did it happen to me? And as opposed to just accepting, like that's my makeup. Like that's the way I am. I didn't, like when I was in school, as a kid and the teacher came in and say, hey, Richie, what do you want to be when you grow up? I didn't put my hand up and say, I want to be a drug addict mm. or an alcoholic. I didn't ask for any of this, you know. But, you know, I did stints in, in treatment centres. First treatment centre I went to was 20 years ago. And it was a place up in Wicklow. It was called Forest. And it was a privately run treatment centre. And, and uh, it was a bit of a holiday camp, to be quite honest with you. And I, and I abused that as well. I remember there was an old guy in there and he was all excited. I didn't want to be there first and foremost, you know, it was kind of get everyone off my back. But there was an old guy who was dressing up on a, on a Saturday and he was all excited. I said, what are you excited about? Like, he said, well, I'm, I'm going out tonight. I'm going to go to the GAA match in Crow Park tomorrow. I said, what do you mean you're, you're going out? In a fucking treatment centre. I said, no, no, we can put in a request. So this guy left and he came back on Sunday, hammered. Mm. I was like, okay. So, and we were allowed to have our mobile phones. Would that on. have been his first time or would that have been the norm? You know, you I, well, I had, I was only there a few days. Yeah, like, so yeah. it was the first time I saw this, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then I was on the phone to a dealer saying, hey, listen, I'm, I'm in a treatment centre in Wicklow, but I have my car here. Can you meet me on the N11? And, and I was getting drugs off him and bring them back to the treatment centre. Like, I'm totally abusing that. Were but you caught? No, I wasn't. <laughs> That shows you what sort of a treatment center it was. <laughs> I was in sitting in front of a counselor trying to counsel a counselor, like telling her what she's doing right and wrong, you know. And um, while under the influence, while under the influence, yeah. Mm. And and at the same time, somewhere behind the scenes in my mind, that I'm I'm convincing myself that I'm in recovery, mm. and that, that this is what it's all about. And mm. uh, came back out there, and and I I said to my family, I said like, cocaine is the problem, like, but alcohol, I'm not a big drinker. And I was never a big drinker in the sense that wasn't that, you know, I'm only going to have two or three pints today. I wasn't a big drinker that might like I get drunk. I get drunk and, and I'm so self-centered. I'm so concerned what other people think of me mm. that I hate that fall around mm. messiness. Mm. Uh, I couldn't hold my drink. I'd be getting sick in lane ways and all that and wipe my mouth and come back in to talk to people again. But then I found cocaine and that allowed me to stay out and drink as much as I wanted on par with everybody. So how old are you now, Richie, if you don't mind me asking? I am. I'm going to be 48 next month. Okay. Yeah. So when did you first snort or whatever way you wanted to? So I remember the first time that I tried any sort of uh, drug was, uh, I was in boarding school mm. in Casnock. I was there for six years. And uh, there was a guy who came into the school and I ended up going down uh, to Galway for, for a weekend. His family lived in Galway. I went down to him for a weekend and his mates were smoking hash. Mm. Uh, I'd never even seen it before, you know, and I'm kind of amused by this. And we ended up in this this kid's garage in his parents' house and they had like a little man cave thing upstairs and we ended up doing that. And they did this thing called a bucket bong, which was like a two litre bottle, plastic bottle with the bottom cut out of it and tin foil in the, in the lid of it, in the, the top of it. And they'd hash and tobacco sprinkled in and then they lit it and they lift it up out of the water and it creates this vacuum. It was like the, it was like the head of a pinty Guinness, it's like thick, creamy smoke. And I'm looking at this and the guys are saying, you got to put your mouth over it, you got to push it down and inhale. And my first thought, because this is my self-centeredness, don't fucking cough, Richie. They laugh at you. Like, don't make a fool of yourself here. Mm -hmm. So I did that. My lungs were on fire and I'm, I'm trying my best not to cough. Mm -hmm. And then they said, oh, you have to do it again. And, and they, they got me to do six in a row. It was my first time ever smoking hash. 
My nickname in, in Salt Hill and Galway was Mr. Green because I literally <laughs> turned green. And, uh, well, it wouldn't surprise me after uh, six. I was as sick as a small hospital. This is the real scary thing with addiction mm. because at that moment, when I, when I came down off that, that, that horrible, sicky feeling, I made a conscious decision that I'm never going to smoke hash again. Mm. I'm never going to smoke weed again. And, and I didn't. For the longest, longest time I didn't. I just would not go, go near hash. But how did it feel at the time? Oh, all lost all sense of control. Like I literally had an outer body experience that I did not like. I mean, like I was found in his garden in a Buddha position, dribbling on myself with his dog licking my face. And I was there for hours. His parents were like, Who, who's this kid? In and this garden? is 17 or this 16. Is 16, or... yeah. But I made that decision then. This isn't for me, you know. I mean, in, in school, like all teenagers, it was we were smuggling drink in and we we're hiding in the floorboards. And where I lived in Port Marnock, we'd, we'd go up drinking in the fields. And, and I, and I kind of lo- liked that. And then I remember going to, you'd remember this, the Trip to Tip was kind of the first music festival. Well, I'm a lot younger than you. Well, just Richie, a you small bit, Paul. The Trip to Tip, I do remember yeah. that. Yeah. I do remember so it was that, our yeah. first kind of real yeah. music festival. Yeah. And uh, I went to the Trip to Tip. Christy Moore was playing. He was one of the headline acts. I ended up taking an acid. And I absolutely loved it. Mm. I loved, it was like a massive hug. I, was, I remember I was congested, just in my head. I just felt so comfortable and so at ease. And there was hundreds of people everywhere. And we had all these tents in a big, big circle. Mm. And I just felt part of. And I couldn't wait to do it again. And I remember there was a girl there who took an acid. And she had a really, really bad trip on it. And I was very conscious of that. But I was in and out of whatever. But I remember hearing a story. I did acid once or twice after that. And then I remember hearing a story about that girl who was at Fela and she had she didn't like she went into a psychosis. So I made a conscious decision then. I'm not doing that again. And I didn't. And as I continue this story, it'll kind of explain to you where I crossed the invisible line of of addiction. So that was an experience on hash that I decided I'm not taking anymore. Then I had that experience on acid that I decided I'm not taking anymore. I liked ecstasy, but I didn't. I was still very fearful of other people. I was going into clubs in town that I didn't feel part of. You know, I couldn't get into the pod where I thought the cool people are and that's where I fit in. Mm-hmm. And I ended up going into the system. And well, you were just too young at that point, is it? Or what, not that I was too young. young. I just wasn't in the click. There was okay. a big click in Dublin then. Okay. I would go to the system and I go to these raves and I just didn't, I didn't feel comfortable at them. Mm. And uh, I was always very, very conscious of people around me and, and how I fit in and how I showed up. Mm. But I enjoyed the effects of ecstasy and, uh, and I would have done that. And that's all recreational. That's party weekends and stuff like that. And uh, Would you have drink on board now at the same I'd time? I'd have drink, not a huge amount. We'd have a couple of drinks before we went out, but then it was water. You know, when you're on yeah, ecstasy, yeah, then it was water, yeah. right? It was, yeah. I don't even think Red Bull was around. Red Bull wasn't around then, yeah. but it was water. like. Yeah. Actually made for quite a cheap night. Well, it did <laughs> until they start charging 10 euros for or 10 pounds or whatever it was then for a fucking <laughs> bottle of water, you know. But I remember one night. So I used to like I'm from Port Marnock and I used to socialize. Tamangos was my mm. was my spot. Where the gang goes. Tamangos where the gang goes. Mm. And uh, I just loved that club. It was just right around the corner from my from my folks house where mm. I grew up. But, you know, as I progressed and the town scene was coming on. And I always wanted to be part of that. And I had a couple of friends that were in PR and marketing and stuff like that. And they, their life started to revolve around town. And I wanted to be part of that. I suppose what I'm really saying is I didn't really feel that I fitted in anywhere. So I was always looking to fit in somewhere else and be part of something else. And uh, I remember I had a really bad experience. Uh, I went into town one night from Tomangos into town. And uh, we couldn't get into this club. We arrived. It was far too late. And there was a fight outside and, and that kind of just, I, I stood back watching, but it disturbed me while on ecstasy. And then the doors opened and this guy came out and he walked straight across the street. There was a parking meter with a bicycle tied to it, but it was the bicycle was lying flat on the ground. And uh, and he tripped over it and hit the parking meter full force in his face. I was like, holy shit. So I went over and I picked him up. I said, are you okay? And he's looking at me and his jaws everywhere and his fucking eyebrows are up the back of his head. 
And he just said, that's the maddest rush I've ever got. And, and I'm looking at him going, wow, okay. I was a demon. I was a devil for drink driving and drug driving uh, back in the day. But so my I, my car, my Jeep was parked across the road and I leaned him up against the kind of the side panel of the Jeep. I said, just get your shit together there. Are you okay? And I turned to talk to somebody and I turned back around and he was gone. I said, where the fuck is he gone? And then I looked down and he's, his head is stuck between the wheel of the Jeep and the curb. And I mean like wedged. And he's just looking at me going, this is mental. And I just had this realization of like, what the fuck? It's like, is that what happens? Is this what goes on with taking exit? Now we got the guy out and he was okay. But in that moment I decided I'm not doing this anymore. That's 20 something years, nearly that's 25 years ago. Mm. But I decided in that moment, no, that's not for me. I'm not doing like, is that what I look like? Is that mm. what I'm capable of? And, and I made that conscious decision. I'm done. And, um, and I ended up. It sounds up, like a strange experience, all right. So all of them were little strange experiences that made, that allowed me the conscious decision of, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't like mm. that. So what it gave me the ability was to stop. So all along, I'm, I'm kind of laying the, the seeds of, I can control this. I can decide whether I want to take this or not. Now, I've no idea what drug use is doing for me in the sense that, you know, is it really helping me fit in? For the longest time, it did. I was at a party one night, and I remember walking into a kitchen, and they were putting out cocaine. And I said, what's that there? And I know here, Richie, you don't, you don't need to be here. So what age was this, roughly? I was in my mid-20s. Okay. I said, no, give us, give us some of that there. No, 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 this is too expensive and all this sort of stuff. I said, give me the fucking go. But I loved it. I absolutely loved what it, for the first time, I could really identify what, what a drug was doing for me. Why? What, how did that make you feel? If you can think of the most elaborate shoulder dropping experience you've ever had, multiply it by a hundred. So, albeit I was with friends, but there was loads of other people there that I didn't know, and they just became part of the furniture. Like, I wasn't concerned about what, I'm, I'm so caught up in what other people think of me. To the point where, you know, a psychiatrist could talk to me and go, Richie, stop living in other people's heads, because I'm constantly trying to decipher what you guys are thinking and of is me. That, that's not how you are these days, though, is not this? Not at all. Okay. Oh, no, right. no, no, so no. this no. is still in, in this, your 20s. This so. is in my 20s, okay. yeah, okay. yeah. And there's no reasoning behind mm. it. Like, I had a fabulous upbringing, an mm. amazing family. Mm. I had traumatic experiences throughout my life. Sexual abuse was one of them that came in when I was nine. And uh, none of these are, I believe today, why I became an addict. But, um, but no... Okay, that is an outrageous traumatic experience that I had at nine years of age. Do, do, you, do you believe that addiction is rooted in trauma? Um, I, to yes. some degree. Yeah, I do, because it's an escapism. So if you don't deal with traumatic experiences, and, and the crazy thing it is, it doesn't have to be a substantial traumatic experience for it to be qualified as trauma. And I believe that today, that like trauma to you at five years of age or six years of age can be something minuscule to you now looking back on it. But at that age, it was massive. That makes any sense to you? Absolutely. Like it could be an experience that you experienced that looking back now as an adult, you'd say, that's ridiculous that I reacted that way yeah. or whatever. But at that five or six or seven or whatever age it is, that's a f that's your fucking world. Like that's a big, big deal, you know? Mm. So yeah, so everybody has trauma in their life. Do you mind me just, and, and I don't mean to pry here, but I know you went to a, a, a priest, a Catholic school mm. led by priests. Mm. It, was the sexual abuse at the hands of priests? No, not at all. No, no. you don't have it, to go into that, Richard. No, I have no problem at all, actually. In, in actual fact, the guy is dead now. Um, it was a guy who worked for my dad. Um, my dad had a truck company. You know, I suppose maybe this is part of not fitting in my older brother, who I just adore. He's one of my best friends today. And, and, and man, I dragged him into the gutter with me in, in addiction. But I remember him as a little kid running around the place and jumping in and out of trucks and washing the trailers. And I just idolized him and I, I, I can't wait to do this. I can't wait to do this. And by the way, I couldn't piece this together for the longest, longest time. It's only in the last few years that I've actually pieced a lot of my life together. So I was kind of like waiting for my turn to come of age where I can drive a truck up and down the docks and mm. 
reverse a trailer into the into the mechanics. Put a sauna on it. <laughs> Put a, yeah, that's why I'm so good at driving your fucking sauna. And I've noticed that. And yeah, Actually, I think we got a comment on one of your Instagrams when yeah. we were. Can you not do this yourself? Type of thing. <laughs> Because Richie, very, and I'm very grateful whenever I need to move the sauna here, there and everywhere, I, I wouldn't have a notion when it comes to stuff like that. Mm. I'm not technically minded, not even to be able to put a trailer onto the onto the, onto the the uh, tow bar. I can't even think of the word, tow bar. Getting the, ha- the sauna into that house in Sligo, mm. do you remember? For oh, the German Jesus, guys? you'd want to have been. <laughs> and Richie did it. And it took a while, mm-hmm. but Jesus Christ, I'd be still there trying to do it. Yeah. Sorry. Not at all, not at all. Um, this is conversation amongst friends. So mm. this is how we're mm. this isn't scripted at our we've no bullet mm. points or anything like mm. that. So mm. but so I, I went away for a weekend with a guy in the in the truck and uh, and he sexually abused me in it. On the first night we were there and I was absolutely perfect I was petrified, right? I knew this was this isn't right. This is, shouldn't be happening. And uh he t- like it's mad. I, I can remember what he said. I can remember the whole act, like of, like playing a tape in front of me, but I can't remember his face. I know who did it, but I couldn't. I bla- I like I'm told from uh, psychiatrists now, or, or from from different counselors that I that I spoke to, that we as a kid you had this ability to block the person's face out. It's a repressed memory, I think. Yeah, it's yeah, good, yeah, yeah. But but everything else is so detailed, like so vivid, and um, we had to go on. I think we were due to stay in the truck the second night and I was like, fuck, no, I just want to go home. I wasn't saying this to this guy. Can you remember where, where like, where, where in Ireland? Yeah, was it was outside Nina. We okay. were on the way to Limerick. We stopped up because it was late. We, or we could have been on the way home, but it was outside Nina. I just remember we pulled up on the side of the road and, and this happened. And this guy was a trusted, trusted uh, family friend, really. So the act occurred, and then the, we were to spend the second night in the truck. So there's bunk beds in the truck, you know. We were to spend the second night. I was and fucking... you at the age of nine? Nine, yeah. Like, nine. you probably... Would you have been scared to say this to anybody? Oh, yeah. I never told anyone for 20-odd years. The first time I brought that out was in the treatment centre, actually. Would you have understood at that age what was happening? No, hadn't a clue. His approach was... Does your dad not do this with you? And I was thinking, there's another fucking thing like that. Like, I, my mind will ex- allow me to exclude. So I'm watching my brother in the in in the yard, and I want to do what he do- does, but I'm not old enough to do that. So I f- I exclude myself. I feel not part of. And then his opening line was, "Does does your dad not do this with you?" I thought there's another fucking thing that my family don't do with me. So this is the sort of stuff we can tell ourselves. Wow. It's it's mad. Like that was his opening line on it, you know. But I remember the second night, and this is the scary part. So the second night, I was like, "Fucking hell, is this going to happen again?" And then another truck belonging to my father pulled up alongside us. I just went, "Oh, thank Christ!" So I didn't sleep, but I felt somewhat safe. I felt comfortable-ish. But that played on my mind for the longest time because I could. I always knew what happened exactly how it happened. And then I'm trying to, I can't remember the, how it came about of the first treatment centre, it was, actually it was, it was that, that place I was in, Forest, right, the one that I was using drugs in. I told her and uh, literally I was getting to the point of, I said I was sexually abused and she wanted to talk about it a little bit and I was about to start talking about it and she looked at her watch and she goes, we'll continue with this again, Richard, but I'm going away, I'm, she's getting married and she'll be back in two weeks. And I'm kind of sitting there going, well, I'm not going to be fucking here in two weeks. And then I was to contact her after I got out of treatment and I tried several times and to no avail. And I had that ability. Is that, ho- is that holiday camp still operating? No, 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 no. I'm not surprised. No, that closed because couple like, years after. Because like A, you're able to smuggle drugs in. Yeah. B, you have a counsellor there who doesn't even want to listen to you. Well, that, that's how I felt in that moment. That's how, That was the facts of it. So what happened in that moment was just don't tell anyone, Richard. Keep it just... Don't tell anyone. And um, and I didn't. The mad thing about it is, as I, as I got to the age, so my younger brother com- comes up behind me and he's in driving trucks around the yard and he's out on the road and he was one of the youngest in Ireland to get his licence. And my father's very, very proud. I'm sure he was proud of me, but very proud of his two sons who are my eldest brother and my younger brother. And they're out working their ass. Now, those boys worked their asses. 
there's one thing about my family and, and not because I'm sitting here in front of you, Paul, but my parents have, have brought us up really, really well. We have a work ethic in us. Mm. Uh, nothing's handed like, and, and we have a, a very fortunate, like my dad's really successful businessman and we're very, very fortunate, but we're good old grafters. Like we mm. get, you've seen me in active life. We no fucking problem getting our hands dirty. But I wasn't doing that. They were doing that. You know, my dad used to say to me, you don't get your fucking license. Get your license and drive trucks. Look at your brothers. Your brothers are doing this. Your brothers are doing that. And I didn't understand why. Fear of failure is a massive thing for me. Part of me was saying, I probably won't pass my test. I'll make a ball. So why even bother doing it? That can still come into my life today. But when I said to you earlier on about joining the dots, the, the joining the dots part was, I was fucking terrified. I didn't want to be in trucks. I didn't want to be a truck driver. I'm holding on to this experience of when I was nine years of age. That wasn't fucking nice. So I think that was a huge part as to why I didn't. But what it did, I feel, I don't think my family realize this or feel this or not that they should have to acknowledge it because they, they wouldn't have known. But it's I felt separated. I felt not part of. Um, so was that something I could have used off the back of? Absolutely. Is it why I'm an addict? I don't think so. I don't need to dissect my being and to figure out why. Do you, like, have you done counselling and oh, stuff uh, in relation amount. to this? So I'll, I'll tell you, I've, I've been very fortunate and I have so many really, really good people uh, mm. in my path that have helped me. Mm. I just couldn't see it at the time. One of the guys, he's a, he's a counsellor and uh, he's his own practice in, in Wexford. And I got to know him. Really, really, really nice guy. Good family friend. And he asked, he allowed me to come down and stay in his house in Wexford in the middle of nowhere. So we went down to Wexford and uh, I was staying in his house and, and we, we spoke about it. Um, I brought it, I actually brought it up in front of my family in a treatment centre, in a treatment setting. And I told them that I was sexually abused by this guy and they were dumbfounded because they were like, there's no way he did that to you. Like he was such a trusted friend of the family and, and a guy who worked for my dad. And I went out using after that treatment centre and unfortunately my family just thought like, what sort of a person uses, makes up an excuse like that to continue using? If a fucking, if a, if a fly hit my wink screen, <laughs> I could use that as an excuse. I can make anything an excuse to use. But that's because I wanted to use. At that time, I wanted to escape. That's the disease. Oh, 100%. That's a start, the trauma. really. That's really mm. the disease, mm. like, taking effect of me. But, um, so I brought it up in the treatment centre and it was kind of dismissed a bit. Family didn't believe me and, and because I went back to my old ways and, and using and drinking and all that sort of stuff. Would your days in, in Castle Knock, like, so at the age of nine, this happens. How does that play a role in your development then as a... I think so, because I struggled an awful lot in school. Uh, I went to boarding school in Castanock, as I said, at the age of 11 from Port Marnock. I actually did a podcast recently for, for an addiction mm. kind of story. Mm. And uh, I was telling the guys that, you know, my first day there, my, f my grandmother's from Drum Condor, so my father picked up my grandmother, dropping me to the school and then drove into town and drove all over Dublin City and then drove out to Phoenix Park. I remember going to the gates of the Phoenix Park down at the, the law, the courts at Deer Park and uh, and going through the Phoenix Park and arriving at Castanock. Now, I was in Castanock for a kind of an open day just to have a look around with my parents and uh, I had no recollection of that, but I remember the day that I was actually starting. My dad drove all over town and it took fucking hours to get there. So I planted this idea in my head. That's why I'm sleeping here. That's why I'm in boarding school, because it's miles away from Port Marduk. It wasn't. It was only 40 minutes, you know. And then the fucking M50 opened. <laughs> um, so the M50 wasn't there at the time. But uh, I went into school, started off, loved school at the start. I had loads of friends. And then just shit, I'm not even going to get, it's not even a question to get into. It. Like the guy, like some of my really best friends today are, the, are guys that, that I, fought with and struggled with and got bullied by and I bullied them. So for the first few years in boarding school, I just didn't like it. I hated it. I absolutely hated it. There was a lot of bullying going on. And uh, north side, south side was a big thing in, the, in, in like late 80s, early 90s. Mm. If you were north side, you were an acker and south side were snobs and yuppies and that. Mm. 
Mm. I was the only north side border in my year. The rest okay. were country guys or south siders. Okay. And uh, so that was a big thing, you know. Uh, and my, my was Colin Farrell in your year? Colin Farrell was in my class. He was a day student, yeah. Mm. So he was in my class for, mm. I think it was three years, three or four years in the class, yeah. Were you mates with him? We were all kind of, we were messers. Like my year that went through was 88 to 94. Mm. We were messers, but they loved it. Like the, the father Shea was the principal and the president of, of the school. And he loved messers that didn't get caught. Mm. He hated, not that he hated, he didn't have time for the nerdy, nerdy bunch. Mm. Loved the messers that, as long as you didn't get caught, you know. But we had, like looking back now, Paul, I wouldn't change any part of it. Like I, I went through a really, really hard time. I genuinely went through a hard time there. Mm. And a lot of it I brought on myself. I had this kind of attitude that if you're going to pick on me, I'm going to hit you. And you think of like when you're 11, 12 years of age, that's fuel in the fire and everyone wants to chase. Of course. I wasn't good at rugby and it was a rugby school. Third year came along and everybody gets an opportunity to try out for the G junior cup team. Mm. And there was one particular teacher there who said to me, Richie, whatever you do in the summer, just stay active and hit the ground running in September when you come back into third year. And, and I did that. I worked my ass off and I got my place on the team. Now my father they were looking for sponsorship. There was a guy in my year whose parents donated a lot of money to the school and they built a gym and whatever else. And my old man ended up uh, sponsoring the, the, the rugby team, the jerseys. So then the slag was, when your dad paid for you to get on the team. You know, right, he's like, okay, fuck yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Give us a break here, will you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, our first game out, so, so the school have to go, the students have to go to the game. And a lot of their parents, there's one thing about Castanock that I really, really loved. We became pally with our friends' parents from going to different rugby matches and all that. And and that's still kind of the same today, you know. Mm. It was our first match and there was three tries scored and I scored the three of them. And I was carried off the pitch by the school. Everything changed that day. Everything absolutely changed. You were respected. I don't know what it was. It mm. just, it was shift. It shifted. Mm. And I, I was always very mindful of juniors that were struggling. I can see juniors that were struggling and I kind of keep an eye on them and become this big brother thing. But equally, I became a bully then because there was a lot of guys in my, old, in my own year or a year ahead of me that I was trying to impress and I wanted to become friendly with. So I would do, I'd be the kind of, I'll do that. Somebody came up with an, an idea to, I'll do that. And I'll do this and I'll, mm. I'll fuck. I'll throw that guy's bed out the window or I'll, mm -hmm. you know. So I started doing the shitty things that happened to me. I started doing them. So I became a bit of a bully myself. And I didn't like that. Mm. You know, well, did you play rugby then up until senior? I, I played rugby up until senior. Now, I didn't get onto the senior cup team, mm. um, but I played rugby up until uh, certainly for fourth, fifth year and then sixth year. I became the head cheerleader for the school then. Mm. I had a louder voice than I, than I, you know, my voice was bigger than my game, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but I was still part of, we, we, we were just a really, really solid group of lads, you know. That, I can relate to that because I went to Mary's in Rat Mines and, you know, mm. Mary's and Castanac would have probably played each other in rugby a lot. But there was that kind of, you're either a rugby player or you're not. You're either cool mm. or you're not. Yeah. And I was kind of, I did play rugby up until transition year and I was really really vicious on the pitch mm. and I, like I was I was scoring all the tries and I was a bigger frame of a guy compared to my like I went through puberty like five or something you know? <laughs> <laughs> like I, I I was bullied in junior school yeah. bullied badly in fifth and sixth year one of the lads used to get a cricket we used to play cricket in the in the summertime mm. you know probably the same uh, glove and boxed the head off me with it and uh, that was in sixth class and between kind of the May of sixth class and the September of first year, mm. I went through puberty and I grew up and I grew out and I grew facial hair. Mm. And when I came back in September, I was the first one to go pu puberty. And he looked at me a completely different way, mm. you know, but I then kind of developed. Uh, I was really good at rugby, um, so much so that after a game with Temple Oak College, I was set upon by pretty much the whole team afterwards and beaten up pretty badly. But I guess I was trying to overcompensate there mm. for my gayness. Mm. OK. Yeah, because, I mean, I've, I've always been gay, I think. But going to an all boys school, you know, yourself, mm. trying to make out to be one of the lads in that. But 
Um, then I started to do musicals and stuff, and you know, I'm clearly gay if I'm, <laughs> if I'm in a musical society. But uh, no, that's 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 interesting. Your first snort of cocaine then at the age of 25. So yeah, I tell you, I'm going to finish off the story of when the guy that yeah. I end up in Wexford with, right? Yeah, okay. And I remember going down and I thought this is because I've been in and out of treatment centres now, right? Mm. So I, I was in the Rutland, I was in a Hope House. I did an outpatient thing in Asheree and I was down with this guy in Wexford and, you know, I decided, right, like this has to be the reason that I'm going through what I'm going through. Maybe it has to be the sexual abuse. I'm looking for, to, I'm looking to label my, my disease. Or, or the reason I, I'm, I have... You're searching I, I, for the truth. Yeah, that I'm an addict. And I remember, so this guy, a, after I told my family in that treatment centre, and it was kind of dismissed afterwards because I used off the back of that, right? And I was told, you fucking, how dare you make an excuse like that? You'll ruin somebody's life, you know? And I was like, Jesus Christ, like, what's it going to take? A couple of years after that then, I got a phone call from my sister to say, did you hear the news? Benny was this guy's name. Did you hear the news uh, about Benny? And I said, no. He said, well, he's, he was arrested. He was caught sexually abusing, I think, a family member of his, a nephew or no something way. like that. And he's been locked up. So I was like, hallelujah. Now they fucking know. And God love my family. Because uh, that's a hard place for, for somebody on the other side to be. So do they disbelieve you? Do they really disbelieve you? It's not that they disbelieve me. I'm just not sure if they fully believe me, if that mm. makes any sense, yeah. because yeah, yeah. I threw that out in, 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 a, in the surroundings of a treatment facility, like mm. in a group therapy setting with, with some of my family members. And I came out of that treatment centre, nothing was really spoken about. And I suppose that Irish mentality is kind of brush it under the carpet and yeah. fucking let, let old dogs lie sort of thing. 100%, yeah. And then I went back into full addiction again. And they were like, you fucking prick. Like, like, whatever way they joined the dots, it was like, he's after making up that as an excuse. And that's why he's fucking using again. So it was just, it wasn't talked about. So when your mom was arrested. So your mom was arrested. I actually had this, oh my fucking God. Because what it did was, I was 99.99% won't, like positive that that happened. It did happen. But I couldn't see his face. So I'm thinking, what if I get it wrong? What if it wasn't him? What if it was a different fucking driver? But I always knew. But that little self-doubt was there. And then the day that phone call came in, I went, oh, my God. Fucking was him. Now, now, I didn't go to my family saying, no, fucking told, told you, you so. so mm. Right. But equally, they didn't know how to react to it. Mm. I do believe 100% today that in all those little moments, I was that nine-year-old kid again. Like standing there, please fucking someone grab me. Someone help me here. Yeah. Keep me safe. Yeah. There's our word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep me safe. Yeah. And, and I didn't get that experience that I thought I wanted. Mm. So the guy gets locked up and I made a couple of phone calls. I was in the car trade for years. You know, Paul, I had my own dealership and I, I sold a few cars to different detectives and I rang one of them and I said, look, I need to tell you something. I don't want you to act on this. This guy, this is his name, where is he? And they told me what jail he was in. Concocted this kind of plan in my head of, I know how to sort this out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to request a visit and I'm going to walk in and he's going to be in fucking whatever issued clothing. Orange suit or whatever. whatever. Yeah, this yeah. is what my head tells yeah, me. Yeah, right? yeah. Maybe I'm watching too many fucking American <laughs> fucking jail well, I, prison shows. I automatically but see there him you in go. An exactly. Suit. Yeah. So it was kind of like, I'm going to walk in mm. and I'm just going to say, I know what you did. I remember what you did to me and you're going to fucking stay here. And I walk out free. So that's, I'm, I created this narrative in my head. It's like a film scene. That this is what it's going to look like. And I went to this counselor guy now, what would that have achieved for you? I don't know. It was kind of like I walk out a free man. I free myself from from whatever was holding holding on to me, and he doesn't. I I felt more maybe it would empower me a bit. But mm. here's the thing: the guy that I was staying with, who's 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 a counselor. I don't know what he said to me, but what I heard was no. He probably said, "Richie, you mightn't get in to see him." He can he can refuse your visit or Richie, what if you no? actually one thing he did say is, Richie, what if if you go in there and he turns around, and he says to you, 
well, you fucking deserved it. And if you, he did say this to me, and if you hit him a dig, which you're capable of doing, he then becomes a victim because he's in protective custody and you're the villain. So what I interpreted that. Do you think he had an ulterior motive for, for coming up with these excuses as to why you shouldn't go in? Or, I think he was trying to protect me, maybe. I don't know. Right. But what I took from all of that was, no, you can't do that. Mm. And I remember saying it to my dad, right? So I went back to the counsellor guy because my dad says, I'll fucking go down with you. Mm. I'll go down with you and see him. And I said it to, the, to, to this guy who was, who was really helping me out. And he, he says, well, whatever about you being capable of hitting him, your dad will fucking kill him. Floor him. Yeah. So he, again, will be the victim because he's in protective custody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you guys are the villains. Yeah. But what I took from that was, no, you can't. So everything was like, no, no, no. And then... I rang the detective guy, he told me what, or I had rang him, told me what jail he was in, and then it was kind of like, what do I do with this? What do I do with this? I'm in active addiction in all of this, right? I'm in and out, I'm all over the fucking place. I ended up, uh, I, I got, I was asked to leave my own business. Luckily, like my brother had the strength, well, he fucked me out, like, but it was a business that I started, and uh, he had asked me to move the business. Man, I was, I was showing up like a train wreck. I was falling asleep at my desk. It was people coming into the, into the garage and we were sending high-end cars. They were coming into the garage to look at fucking 200,000 euro cars and I'm up at a desk like snoring because I'm on a three-day binge or something, you know? And Would um, you use at work? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's mad because the one thing that I... I remember the, the, like the pro progression of, of the disease of... Jesus, I don't use like them. I, I never tried that drug. I don't use like them. I wouldn't, I'd never do it in work. I'd never do it on my own. And they were all not yet. I didn't see it at the time. They're all not yet. And then I crossed that, every fucking one of those lines I crossed. Like the whole, I'll, I'll never do it on my own, came rapidly. You know, I bought a lovely house in Port Marnock and I was living in it. And I remember there was a, there was a wedding coming up. So like, when I, when I started doing cocaine recreationally, I just knew where to go to get it. So that's where I always went because I knew it was going to be there. Great. Started to get to know the people that would have it. To then, well, I'm not going this Friday unless I had that boxed off on Thursday. I want to make sure I have it, especially a wedding or uh, like a big party event. I need to get that, make sure I have that a day before I go because then it's a shoulder drop. Oh, I'd have it and I can go about my day and do whatever. I remember one particular weekend, I'm living on my own and there was a big wedding coming up on a Friday and it was a weekend wedding and I'm coming home from work on Wednesday and I said, I need to go and organise that now. So I made my phone calls, whatever, and I got quite a bit of it, of coke. And I said, right, lovely, that's parked, that's, that's sorted. When you say quite a bit, can you just quantify I'd that? I'd say thing? it would have been two eights that I had, two eight balls. And that's a lot. That's a lot. And um, for your own use, for my own use, yeah, yeah. Would uh, you share? I, yeah, I would. I would. Oh, no, I wouldn't. So, so it wasn't secretive using, no, it was no, no. Like, this is well, this wedding would have been, I would have kind of tested the waters to see, mm. you know. So, I got it on the Wednesday and I went home and got a Chinese and I'm kind of it was a black tie wedding. And uh, I'm like, oh, this is gonna be a fucking great weekend, this is gonna be a super weekend, it's green light playing the PlayStation and just playing the PlayStation, whatever I was doing, this talk comes into my head. Richie, go up and check it, make sure it's okay. It's not, not fake. Oh, I knew it was okay. It's not a dud, yeah. Yeah. Just take one line and make sure it's good. You know, because there'd be nothing worse than showing up this weekend and it's a bag of fucking dirt like. And I'm having that argument with my head going, I know it's okay. It's like a fucking two-way conversation. Leave, oh. it, leave, it, leave it there. Don't touch it. No, no, no. Go up and try it. Go up and try it. This is going on for half an hour and, and I always give into it I give into that voice and sometimes that internal conflict could it actually be worse than the actual act of using itself because for me it was well, can I drink can't I drink yeah and you're fucked up but you see I'm not, I haven't gotten to the point where I'm telling myself I can't mm. I'm, t mm. I'm at a point of telling myself don't touch it Richie because you know where this is yeah. going to go but anyway what happens then so I go up and I fucking take a line Mm -hmm. and it hits me 
And I go, mm. okay, fucking grand. Yeah, yeah, that works. Yeah, that, that's it's good. real. Yeah, so then I go down and have a few beers mm. and then I take more and then I'm like, holy fuck, right, this, and it's strong. And then I can't play PlayStation anymore. I can't watch fucking television because I'm constantly flicking. And then there's a noise outside and I'm like, oh my God, what's that? Who's there? This little paranoia buzz kicks in. But then somewhere in my mind, I'll tell myself, do another one because that'll make that all go away. <laughs> And I continued to do it, and I continued to do it, and I continued to do it. I remember reaching a point where, so this is Wednesday night. I've now rolled into Thursday. And I'm conscious that I have a wedding to go to tomorrow because my tuxedo is hanging on the fucking back of the wardrobe and my shoe, everything's there ready to go. And I'm saying, oh, Rishi, you got to stop now. And I don't, I keep going, and I keep going, and I keep going. I, my nose hemorrhaged, right? I just remember busting blood and then dry retching and I'm holding on to the toilet bowl crying down the toilet going please we're going to stop and I'm getting sick and blood everywhere and um, palpitations Paul. I thought my, my fucking heart was going to come through my chest and the rabbit hole prayers please God please please don't let me die not like this please help me get out of this one I promise I'll never do it again and I blacked out and I woke up at so this is going from Wednesday all the way through to Thursday into Friday morning. I blacked out and I woke up with God knows how many missed calls on my phone. Do you know the anxiety you automatically get? <gasps> Fuck. Put the phone down. Jesus Christ, the bed is covered in blood. The sick in the bathroom. I'm like, what the fuck? And I'm thinking, oh my God. The text, Richie, where where are you? Where are you? You know. Everyone else is in the church. Yeah. I'm, I'm just getting into a taxi now. I'm on the way, yeah, you yeah. know. And then I look over and there's still quite a bit of coke left on the bedside table. And I, that was a shoulder drop moment. Oh, thank God. So I went from that high panic state, anxiety through my fuck out the yin yang mm. to then looking at this going, oh, thank God. We're okay. Yeah. And went back using it. Turn off the phone, fuck the wedding and keep using. Did the wedding ever happen? Well, it did. Well, the wedding, it wasn't my fucking wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it just as well? You weren't getting married. Just as well. So, yeah. So, I knew then I was real trouble. Like That was it. That it was, was your, was that your lowest moment? Uh, one of, mm. one of, um, I had loads of them, Paul. Mm. I had loads of experiences of using against my will. And if you're an addict or you're struggling with an addiction, you'll understand what that is. If you're not, I'm sorry, you just won't. Mm. You just won't understand People that don't mm. suffer with the disease of, of addiction will never don't understand because mm. you can choose to put it down. You can choose to stop. You can't. Mm. I've, you lose all power of choice. I've zero, zero control and no fucking self-will in the world is going to be powerful enough to, no. to stop it. You know, Paul. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. So there was loads of experiences like that. Yeah. Um, as I said, I lost the business and all that sort of stuff and I ended up getting a job in a nightclub environment which wasn't really good for me <laughs> I can imagine not. yeah I was like this fucking old bollocks on the door like trying to fit in with with younger people mm. <laughs> thinking that I have a purpose now and they need to come through me to get into the VIP sort of thing you know and would that would that kind of behavior be fueled by coke would you be standing at that door would you see I start because a lot this guy was really really good to me mm. and um I, he gave me a job in his offices first. And we were doing kind of marketing and PR and I was really good at that. Mm. I'm really good at a lot of shit, actually. Mm. Fear gets in the way of a lot of it. It won't let, it'll, fear will come in and say, no, don't, don't try that because you'll fail. So f I still have this fear of failure. So it fueled, it fueled my addiction. That environment absolutely fueled my addiction. And I made seriously, seriously fucking stupid decisions um, which endangered my life, both internally by myself by the quantities I was using but externally as well it was people who were fucking coming after me like I owed serious amounts of money out um, took it I really abused my family um, in the sense that I could I knew how to manipulate to get them to they paid bills for me out of fear out of fear for my my brother would have organised out of fear for who's going to bang on my parents door and people knocked on my parents door like People threaten my parents. Dangerous people? Yeah. Yeah. Anyone's fucking dangerous. Like they're they're living in a lot of them are living in fear too. They owe mm. somebody else. 
mm. you know. So um, I, I, I put my family in, in really, really fucking horrible circumstances. My father came up one day. I was standing outside and I went in to collect my wages or something like that. And he came up and he said, get into the car. And I thought, OK, what's going on here? My uncle was with him. God rest him. My uncle Damien, who my your dad, parents know. Your dad, dad played squash. Play squash, squash yeah. Him, yeah. My uncle Damien was some man. Yeah, he was fucking brilliant. He is brilliant. And um, he's a massive part of my recovery now, Paul. But so my dad and my uncle were in the Jeep and uh, they said, get into the car. And my dad hit redial and some detective came on and he said, Richie, like you're in trouble big time. And uh, he, uh, we suggest you get out of the country. Now, I don't know if this was a setup, but I was told I'm going to a treatment in America. And so do you, so why did the detective say you're in trouble? That I got into something that I shouldn't have done. Um, and I owed a lot of money out of it. And uh, was it a real detective? This, uh, I don't know today. I don't know. Mm. I took it as it was. Mm. I was like, fuck, I, like, I'm fucked. My parents had a house in Sligo, so we drove to Sligo. And my dad says, you're not going home. You're not going near the house. We went and bought new clothes or whatever. And he says, you're going to treatment in America. And roughly what age were you, Richie, when this This is happened? 2014. So fairly recently. Yeah, 2014. Okay. I was going to a place called Burning Tree Ranch in Dallas. Mm -hmm. I'm an entitled little shit as well. Because part of me went, I'm going to a fucking ranch. Like riding horses. Game on. Yeah. Fucking, I always you wanted to be this a cowboy. You thought this was the forest again. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I envisioned like fucking John Wayne riding yeah, a horse yeah. around the paddock, <laughs> herding cattle, you know. Do I bring golf clubs? I don't yeah. even fucking play golf, you know, but yeah. they're like entitled bullshit. Mm. And uh, man, so I, I flew over to America and I end up in this treatment center. The first part of it is in Austin, Texas. I got off the plane and it was 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Jesus. Couldn't fuck a breed. I don't know what that is in Celsius. It was fucking hot. Hot. And I went to this place, man, and it wasn't a big ranch. It was like, what the, f what the fuck? Like, where am I? But you know what? I was a novelty in there because I was Irish. I was real Irish with an Irish accent. And everyone fucking loved me and everyone thought, this guy's great. And I could play that. And... um I stayed in that treatment center for, I got into a relationship with a member of staff in that treatment center. And here's what's really important and uh, maybe just sits with somebody. I, I used to question my sexuality. I never experimented in any way, shape or form, right? But because of that sexual abuse, I used to question like, why, why do I feel like this? Why am I so uncomfortable in, around females? Why am I so uncomfortable sexually? Like really uncomfortable. Okay, with porn. Like that, that kind of seediness. I liked seediness, but on my own, not part of, right? So I used to really question, what the fuck is wrong with me? Terrified of women, like genuinely terrified of women. I could get eye contact 50 times and if I, I couldn't go over and say hello. But if I was introduced, I'd fucking burn the ears off them or if I had drink or drugs on me, yeah, it fucking freeze me up and all that sort of stuff. My relationship became cocaine, by the way. So a lot of guys be it gay or straight or whatever the case may be, you go out on a weekend night, you're single and your ultimate goal is to go home with somebody. My ultimate goal was to go home on my own with that bag of cocaine because that was my relationship. You know, that was my fucking... So I could have women throwing themselves at me. I'm not saying they did, but I could be like, oh, you're good, thanks. I'm going home with this, you know, not telling them, but in my own internal mm. dialogue, you know. Mm. So you got it on with one of the... Workers in yeah, so, the ranch. But th that's the power th of the disease. So I'm here, right? I have no cocaine, I have no, I have no drugs and I have no alcohol. And I don't like how Richie is. I don't like how I feel. And it just shows me that the power of this, the, anything that fucking moved and was female, my radar was on them. Because I needed something to change the way I felt. I don't, wasn't comfortable in my own skin. Mm. I don't think I fully accepted that I'm in treatment again and, you know, let's do something about it this time, Richie. It was like, there's a girl. Okay, talk to her and chat her up and all. And they used to have all these little contracts in treatment where you weren't allowed fucking eye contact. You weren't allowed to talk to them. I was in trouble all the time. <laughs> but I end up getting into a relationship with a fucking member of staff, sexual relationship with a member of staff. God love her. She ended up getting fired. And I'm sure they would, if it was, if I was American, they'd so fucking you were found yeah. out. I was caught, yeah. She wrote me this love letter and left it under my pillow. We went to one of these outings, <laughs> recovery outings, and I denied it. And then they produced the letter. I was like, fuck. Mm. But 
they explained to me like the lengths that I would go through, go to to change how I felt. I was constantly needed. So drugs and alcohol were my solution to whatever way I felt internally. To escape that, get high, drink, get drunk. That's my escapism. Mm. And it worked for the longest time and then it stopped working. It's like mm. a fucking boomerang comes back and cuts you in half eventually, you know? Mm. So I was looking for to escape through other means and one of them was through females and sex and that chase and all that sort of stuff, you know? So I did that treatment center for uh, 13 months inpatient. Wow. Yeah, 13 months. Jesus. Uh, Is do, that longer than usual? It's average about between nine, nine months in a year. Yeah. So it started in Austin, then we progressed up to Dallas, mm. Texas. It's a it's a bigger scent. This, this is the ranch. Mm. This place is beautiful now. Right? I'm thinking like 28 days, the Sandra Bullock movie, you know, that's kind of, <laughs> it's all done in a month and you're out. Yeah. And I did she's the, a changed person. I she did the spin horse's <laughs> leg and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, 13 months, wow. 13 months, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and how, did you come out a different person? Yes, mm. I did. I worked at, I worked the program. Mm. I was helping other people. I was volunteering in, in different things. I made really, really solid, solid mates. I lived with two guys that were in treatment with me. Here's the thing. Looking back now, was I in this big recovery bubble? Yeah, I think so. Was I relying? Was there a lot of ego involved in the sense, look how well I'm doing, look what I'm doing. I'm doing this and I'm doing that. Mm. I got into a relationship with a girl uh, who was in recovery, but I was kind of warned not to get into it. And I didn't pay any heed to it. Like I was blinded by her. She was beautiful. And I was blinded and whatever. And they end up going out with this girl and I'm in recovery. She decides that she wants to go drinking again. And it's the relationship has come toxic. And I'm, I'm kind of every six months I had to leave America to renew. I was on a medical visa to renew mm. the visa. And I come home. I have a daughter, Georgia, who's 11 now. And uh, I came home one time and I took her on a family holiday, which was amazing. And then I injured myself on that family holiday and I couldn't travel back to America. I had to get operations on my leg and eventually came back and my girlfriend in the States was questioning why I was there so long and was I playing offside and was I doing this? And so there was toxicity starting to move into this relationship. I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? And she got found out then by the treatment team that she'd relapsed and I was told to stay away from her and I wasn't listening to them anymore. I was now at a point in my, I was in, within aftercare and I was just finishing up after I actually graduated from the treatment center. So you make all your own decisions and what you're doing, you know, and I start making the wrong ones. The scary thing is her life when she went back out drinking, her life started to look a lot shinier than mine. Mine started to look mundane. I'm I'm everything's recovery. It's the same meetings, same people, same fucking this, same that she's going to pool parties and barbecues and hanging around with this people and going to this cool restaurant and I'm going, what the fuck? And then the times that I did go out with her, I felt like that, that younger version of myself again. I don't, I don't belong here. I don't fit in. Mm. So, uh, yeah, in that treatment center in America, I look at my life in recovery versus her life out there. And then before I knew it, I was out there with her. Mm. And that went really bad, really, really quick. Mm. To the point where I end up getting arrested over a domestic uh, accusation, um, and then I was l bailed out, and I was rearrested by Homeland Security now because my visa was revoked, and then I was bailed out, and then I got deported. So I'm deported from America. This is so poignant to being an ACL. and I stayed in full blown addiction for three years, and uh, to the point where my only way out, and I don't know if you've experienced this at all throughout your disease, Paul. My only way out that I thought, or the easiest way out, was to put a, a noose around my neck and, and hang myself. And that's where I went. Do you identify with any of that sort of stuff and with regards to your journeys? There was a time where my parents lived in uh, Bushy Park uh, apartments just after selling Ternier. And I was going to jump over the railing. It was the penthouse and I was I was I was going to jump. I was contemplating jumping over the railing. Mm. And that was that. But that was um, that was a Wednesday. And on the Saturday prior to that, I had been taking this herbal ecstasy. Do you remember the hemp shops? Mm. 
that shit really fucked you. Never went into one of them. Yeah, <laughs> that really fucked you up. But I did. That was that was that was yeah. That was a low point for me. I mm. did. I did consider it was like how if I jump over that railing now, will I die immediately, or will I kind of injure myself and then die in hospital later, or how can it quickly? How can it just end as quickly as possible? And that did happen to mm. me. That was the lowest point of my addiction. Um, I guess that was in my early 30s. Let's move on to Ackel now. Yeah. Ackel. But OK, so think of that lowest point that you had in your life. Mm. And I reached a low, low, low point, in mm. probably the lowest point in my life, mm. where the, the, the flex out of a vacuum looked so attractive to put around mm. my neck and hang myself. Mm. And a guy who was a family friend who tried to help me prior to this walked in the door of my house and he saw this, the condition I was in, the state that I was in. And he was back and forth with my family talking to him. My family were absolutely done, heartbroken, done, can't fucking do this anymore. Leave him. You can see Lambay Island from my parents' house. And my dad made a statement of, can we not just put the fucker out on the Lambay Island, leave him out there? And in that, it was a light bulb, light bulb moment because the guy who would, Niall, I don't know if he wants me to use his full name, but Niall knows who he is. And man, I wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for Niall. And another guy called Mark P. Mark was in Ackle. You met Mark. He's in Ackle in, in his holiday home, studying to be a psychotherapist. Then he's in recovery. My dad said, can we not put the fucker out on Lambay Island and leave him there? And then Niall went to the island and he made a phone call to Mark. I have a guy who really needs help. Can he come down to you? Niall came back to me and said it to me and I was like, yeah, whatever, okay, yeah. No, but inside I'm saying, get the fuck out of my house and leave me alone. Like, fuck off all of you. But what came out of my mouth was like, oh, okay, okay, where am I going? Ackle. Like, I didn't even know there was a bridge onto the island. Had you ever been to Ackle? Never in my fucking life. Never in my life. And uh, So you thought you had to take a boat out to Ackle? Yeah, that's what I was trying to figure out. Did you fucking take a ferry to, like, fuck me, I'm going to it. What? So um, you arrive in Ackle then? Arrive in Ackle on the 5th of November 2020 mm. and it scared the living daylights out of me. It was like something out of a fucking Star Wars movie. Mm. Bog, brown, dark, wet, dreary. World. I thought. Remote. What the fuck am I doing here? Lonely. Didn't experience the loneliness at that point. It was just like, mm. how is this going to help me? And... Uh, you know the house that I stayed in and I woke up the next day and probably didn't wake up the next day because I didn't sleep that night. I was awake all the way through and wind was howling and the weather was really bad for the first couple of days. I thought, what the fuck? I couldn't see anything. Like, And there's beautiful views from his house. I just couldn't see it. And after a short period of time, my entitlement comes back in. Like, fuck a bed is lumpy. He only has three channels on TV. There's a lot of crap and couch isn't comfortable and I don't like this and I don't like that. All in interior dialogue in my head and I'm ringing my sponsor and he's saying, shut the fuck up, like, yeah. you grateful fucker, like, mm. be grateful for what you have and where you're at. And we're in and out of lockdown as well, which was so suitable because I was so afraid of people that there was nobody around. Nobody was, a, nobody was around. Sheep is all I saw. Mm. And I start going for these walks, Paul, and you know the walks that I was doing, up right along where your sauna is, um, into Duke and Ella, onto the beach, walk down. I used to walk, do you know the river that crosses, that breaks the beach up? Mm. I didn't even fuck how deep it was. I just walked through it. I just wanted to get to the other side to go down to that little shop and get a packet of sweets or something. I had no money. I had like maybe a fiver. My dad was giving me 50 quid a week for cigarettes, whatever. I'm in my 40s. And um, do these walks, do these walks. And one day, Mark brought me to Ken Bay and he didn't say anything in the car. He wanted to watch my reaction and he didn't get one. So Ken Bay is the beach that's at the end of the island. It's the top 20 beaches in the world. It's voted all the time. It is mind-blowingly spectacular. It's just, it's bucket list stuff. But we drove there and I didn't lift my head. He was driving, he was watching me and he didn't get a reaction. And we got down to the beach and down the bottom and I walked around the beach a little bit and I was kind of like going, yeah, this place is really, really nice, beautiful. And we drove back up and he's like, man, like what's going on in your head? Like you didn't react to any of it. I just couldn't see it. What was going on in your head? I don't know. Fear. 
get me off this fucking island. I didn't want to use. I genuinely didn't want to drink or use. I getting into the car on that Wednesday, the fifth of November, was a surrender. Mm. We came back from Cam, and then a couple of weeks away, my my walks were getting longer and longer. And I remember I was there maybe two or three weeks, two weeks, walking every day. And I went on a walk one day, and just everything looked different. I was like, "Holy shit! Like, look, wow! Look at this place, the lake." Mm. Uh, the mountain, Sleeve, Sleeve Moor at the back of the mountain, uh, Crohan, all these different places on the island that you can see from pretty much one spot. Like It was like, oh my God, Like look how stunning this place is. I'm working a program with my sponsor. We're doing all the meetings and doing what we have to do. And nature is just, Ackle is lending itself to me. Mm. I started to feel real safe. I went on a walk one day, Paul, and I had my phone and I got one of these seven day free trials for Apple Music and I fucking hit it. My my old debit card must have been still assigned to that phone because it gave me the seven day free trial. And I remember I had an old pair of earphones and I'm listening to fucking music. I started looking around me to see if there was people around because I wanted to kind of dance. I started to feel free. I wanted to have this little skip of my step sort of thing, you know, and uh, just walk around like the fucking same wet, uh, Rain bottom, same blue raincoat. I'd say people were going, who the fuck's the guy in the blue that's walking? Every, it was like Forrest Gump. And I walked past this building site one day. I was there in the island, maybe three or four, maybe a month. I said to Mark, the guy I was staying with, I said, Mark, I'm going for a walk. He said, where are you walking? I said, Ken Bay. <laughs> you fucking good luck with that. Like it was 11 and a half miles from the house. I didn't know. My uncle had died six months prior to that. And I'm halfway down you know, the hill up, up by Corrymore. Mm. So I'm on the way up and I'm like, oh, fucking hell, this is this is long. And you just get to that little crest and then the wall road winds on, you got to go again. Mm. I was like, I'm not going to fucking make this. It was a park bench opposite the turn for Corrymore. So that's on the side of the road and I sat down. And in that moment, Paul, I'm sitting up there, the sun started to shine. I'm looking into the Atlantic Ocean and America is next port of call. If I fall off this fucking edge here, I'm going to... Boston, New York. Yeah, next stop. But Richie, you're banned from there. Mm. You're not allowed there. And then I'm looking at Clare Island and I can see the Inishes in the, the background and then I can see the peak of Crow Patrick. And I was actually awake for the first time. I was like, oh my God, like, wow. And in that moment, like, Clare Island, they were all like, they were like sleeping giants. Mm. And I felt microscopic. I felt so small, so insignificant in that moment. And I said, my uncle, as I said, did everything he could to help me when he was here. And I just had this thought that he'd fucking do the same wherever he is now. And I said, please, please, please help me. Please help me. And it was one of them snap bubble cries. I start crying and it was uncontrollable. And I got up and I walked and I kept on my walk and I went down to Kemp. This is December. There was nobody around. Took off my clothes, walked into the sea. And I came out of the beach, out of the sea and like like reborn <laughs> it was like a fucking brand new penny and I wasn't afraid of people then I wanted to kind of meet people and test the waters what's recovery like in Ackle is there people is there people in the program and I met a guy Michael Callahan, who you know very well and his family Kate they're my Ackle family like mm. they really are he gave me a job on a building site fuck the days of Top Gear I worked for Top Gear and I worked in my own dealership and partied with VIPs and A-listers and all that shit. I was pushing wheelbarrows and digging holes and fucking doing whatever was at, sweeping up building at this building site. And he gave me a job and he became my best mate. And I wouldn't, I didn't like going home that eve in the evening after work. I wanted to stay with him. I just felt really safe with him. And we built up this relationship. And this is Ackle people, right? This is a lot of people in Ackle. So I asked Michael for a job and he says, uh, what can you do? I said, I can put, I can, push a wheelbarrow and dig a hole. He said, well, I don't need anyone to fucking push a wheelbarrow and dig a hole. And I remember seeing a digger, a machine outside the house where he was working. I said, I can drive machines. He said, can you? I said, yeah, no, I can, yeah. He says, right, I'll ring you back. And he said something to, he rang his wife. He says, some fella from Dublin's down here. He's fucking Richie. It's locked down. He said he can drive machines. I need a machine driver. And his wife, Kate, says, he sounds like a bogey. Stay the fuck away from him. So Mike, Michael rang me that evening and uh, he said, can you start tomorrow morning at half seven? I said, yep. I went down a pair of tracksuit bumps, a pair of runners, no safety gear, nothing. No, I had a safe pass, actually. 
And he says, get up in the machine and move this here and do that there and break this down and blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, no problem. I got up in the machine. Okay, this works here and fucking dig her up. He went into the house, but he's watching out the window and there's a big blade, like a bulldozer blade in the front. And I just put that down. I fucking drove straight through all the shit that I was supposed to move. And he came out and he went, get off that fucking machine. You couldn't drive your finger up your arse, he says to me. He says, I thought you said you could drive it. I said, well, I drove from there to here. <laughs> and he's looking at me going, who the fuck are you? Like, what's your game sort of thing, you know? I says, I really need a job. I just, I need, I need a job, pal. I really do. And he brought me into the house. We start doing labor stuff for him and helping him out and clean the building site. I, I just didn't stop working. And he says, right, you're a grafter. He said, I'll give you till Friday and then we'll see what happens. And didn't hear, work till Friday, didn't hear anything till Sunday night. He rang me, he says, can you come in tomorrow? Oh, yes. Yes. So I was working him for him for a while and at five o'clock, the lads go home and I say, are you doing anything else? You want me to help you? Can I help you anywhere? I don't want money. You're like, I just want to, I'll help you. And he says, if you, you fucking, if you know home to go to, like, you're afraid to go home. I said, no, I just, like, go home and do what? So we end up working late on a site on, a, on his own, one of his own places. And uh, he says to me, you come home for dinner. I said, no, 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 I'm grand. He said, no, you will, you'll come home for dinner. I said, no, Mike, I'm grand, thanks very much. I was terrified. He said, you're fucking coming home. And I went home to this guy's house. And his wife, Kate, was there and, and his three boys, actually, um, Sean, P Harry and Paddy. And I walked into the house and I was panicking. I was shit myself. And we sit down at their dinner table and they're all chats and how are you doing? And look at me up and down and fucking who's this fella? Who's this book, as they call me, yeah, from yeah, Dublin? Yeah. And um, we had dinner. I, was hold, I had to hold in the tears. I actually, for the first time in a long, long time, felt... Accept it. If I was a fucking horrible piece of shit, I wouldn't be at this man's family's t dinner table. People in Ackle are very, very clever, Paul, and they give you a chance. I think you believe that. They give 100%. you a chance. And uh, they just did. Didn't ask questions. They just, he's all right. He just, he needs to be loved and he needs to be looked after. And they did that for me. Like, they fucking loved me to death. His, the youngest son, Paddy, put me down as an emergency contact on his last school journal. And his uncle Connor was in traveling Brazil. And if he didn't make it back in time, he was asking me to be his sponsor for his confirmation or his communion, whatever it is. That's mind blown stuff, given where I came from. And Having come from where you Like in addiction and that, you know. Have you any stories like that about Ackle, Paul? Considering that this is your show, really. <sighs> Ackle to me has been like a control alt and delete button. Okay. You know, it's it's been an opportunity to just put the shit behind me mm -hmm. and to start afresh. And I've never looked back and like when I when I first moved to Ackle, I was on antidepressant antidepressants up to me gills. I'm now off them. I remember you I've, saying that to yeah, me. Yeah, I've 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 been able to wean off them mm. because the life down there is just it's 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 worlds apart to to Dublin. Again, down to yourself, Richie. Ackle is a place of safety now. Mm. You know, and okay, there can be tough, challenging times, winter time, loneliness. Um, but you know, I can't really go into the pub and order a pint of Coors Light. Mm. Because Joe and Ted's or Paul and the Amethyst will say, what the fuck are you doing? Mm. You know, so it's a safe place in many, many ways. I could, of course, go into Sweeney's and buy a slab of Coors Light and go home on my own and do it. But yeah, but I get that because Joe is one of my best friends on the mm. island. He's my business partner, you mm. know, with the bikes, with mm. Blast the Bikes. Mm. But it's the same thing. Like Joe has told me, he said, don't ever. Don't ever come in and ask ask me for a pint. You, you'll never get served here. Mm. <sighs> Guys, this was a heavy, a fucking heavy episode for me. Honestly, like, well, like the stuff you'd said there, like, mm. Jesus, it has hit home, you know. Um, and I guess my intentions of this podcast was to investigate whether addiction is essentially rooted in trauma and 
your trauma is 10 times worse, I believe, than mine. And you're telling me that it's not. So I think that's extremely interesting. Um, so thank you for coming on, Richie. It was a tough podcast. I don't know if we can, like, I don't know where to go from there, to be honest with you. <laughs> but again, thank you for being the inspiration that brought me to Ackle and that made my life, uh, uh, now it's not entirely down to you, but no. I, I have a, I really like my life at the moment. Mm. And I'm very grateful to have you as a friend. Yeah. And, and absolutely. And we don't see each other all the time, but when you no. pick up the phone, either one yeah. is there, so. It seems that we're both very similar in ways. There's a gulf of difference between our pre-life and our current life. Mm. You know, running a sun on a beach. Imagine like being a beach bum. <laughs> yeah, Paul, I rent out bikes on the Greenway. <laughs> yeah, isn't? But Boom. but are are you happy? Yeah, very much so. And me too. Genuinely am. Yeah. Like Paul, the journey I believe is only beginning. Mm. Like we're starting. We've put things in place for ourselves. Business wise, we have two, both have amazing houses. We have our dogs there. I have two potbelly pigs on the way, by the way. <laughs> oh, I have two donkeys. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I'd love to get two donkeys. What pigs have you got? Potbelly pigs. Potbelly pigs. Yeah. All right. Where would they go? I don't fucking know. In the garden somewhere. Yeah. So, I mean, like, we're building our lives. Mm. Like, we're only there. I know you're going to ackle back and forth for years, but reality, like, I'm only on the island three years, man. You're two and a bit, mm. like full time. Yeah. Um, that's early days mm. for two guys that experience. Do you feel welcome on that island? Yeah, big time. Mm, still loads of people that I don't know. I'm brutal with names. Mm. All right with faces. Still one or two nutters. But, uh, well, you, we get that everywhere. Yeah. But the reality of it is, Paul, you know, there's nowhere... You said it at the start of this, you walk into a shop now and you have a five minute conversation with anyone that's in the shop. Mm. You can do that in your local shop and wherever you grew up and you don't get that. You know, we walk into, into Ted's pub and we get a bit of lunch and we know all the staff there and we have a bit of crack with them or whatever and the bike, bit, the bike shop's out the back. And, you know, what I love about Ackle is all what's happening now, I really believe, there's loads of little businesses there that are, we're all starting to click and and work with each other. Yeah. And I don't think that's happened in quite a while in Ackle. I'm told that actually that mm. hasn't happened in quite a while. Mm. But like the lads in Ackle surf with me, with the bikes, the cottages that we both looked at, your saunas, uh, your new cottage, what you're doing. There's mm. loads of stuff. It's not just what we're taking from Ackle. It's what we bring to Ackle too. You've brought... Madness. A little bit of madness, which is great. You've maybe you've woken like you need to be woken up after the co after COVID, after lockdown, mm. and uh, a lot of people have come to Ackle off off the back of you being there, mm, well, and no, they gen genuinely you. have, and uh, through your Instagram and all that sort of stuff. That's recovery, Paul. That's recovery one oh one. State your claim, stand your ground, and work for what you want. Mm. We weren't able to do that prior. We weren't. We always had ambitions and envisioned what I wanted, but I could, it was all unreachable. Did you watch the Banshees movie? Yeah. Do you believe that that's a reflection of reality in Ackle in some way? I don't Hard. like you no more. I don't. But you <laughs> liked me yesterday. <laughs> yeah, actually, <laughs> there is one particular is thing that springs to mind. <laughs> it's a massive reflection of somebody's life in Ackle. We won't go there. No. Look, I think, Richie, we leave it at that. Yeah. Um, thank you for coming in again. Absolute pleasure. Folks, thanks for tuning in to today's episode. If you were affected in any way by anything in the episode, please visit my Instagram, where in my link tree, there'll be various links to get some support. <laughs>